Welcome to my secret winter cabin. It's a very humble abode if I do say so myself. I decided to come here to reminisce about the past and then when I look outside to see how extremely cold it is, it gave me some inspiration to talk about one of my personal favorite worldwide events. But before you get into that, let's talk about what's actually going on out there because it's not good and I might be snowed in here for a few hours. You know, cold weather across the population is one of the most mixed bags I've ever been a part of as a dysfunctional member of society. Tons of people love it while well, others absolutely despise it. I'm more in the middle where it really depends on my mood that day. Being cold generally isn't fun because all your focus is on trying to keep that body temperature up and not being able to perform in bed, but I can't relate to that because apparently inexperience is a turnoff. Cold weather is a clear refresher from the scorching heat unless you live in Florida or California. Even then, cold weather hits different up in the Midwest. There's a lot that goes on in the world while we're snowed in. Christmas, New Year's, my birthday, and everyone suddenly craving hot chocolate out of nowhere. Listen, I love me some hot chocolate, but when it comes to drinks at that time of the year, it's all I hear about. Winter has always been weird just like every other season, but it's mostly between summer and winter because whenever people are sick of summer, they beg for winter, and it's the exact same thing when they get sick of winter and beg for summer. It's a vicious cycle that'll never end, even though there is a cool aspect to winter, and that's the possibility of sports to play during certain times of the year. The only real winter sport I have experience with is ice skating, and for some reason it's becoming a nostalgia memory since it's been literal years since I've last been ice skating. And then there's everything else. Skiing, snowboarding, curling, and hockey. Hell, I don't even remember sledding that much, even though I do remember sledding at some point in my life, but I don't remember when because it's been so long. But what about professional sledding? Yes, that's a real thing, but it's a lot different from the sledding most people are familiar with. Imagine getting paid to slide down around a course at 120 miles an hour. I think I'd rather stay in my cabin and talk about video games. But first, let's talk about the Winter Olympics. The twin sibling to the Summer Olympics that happen every four years and two years after the Summer Olympics. While I don't believe it's as popular as its summer counterpart, it's still astounding to me as a huge fan of the Olympics. Watching every country's best athletes go at it in the most competitive sporting event of all time will always be a treat to witness. I was introduced to the Winter Olympics in 2014 and then went on to watch every Winter Olympics except 2022 because as I get older, my brain gets smaller. But I love the Winter Olympics just as much as I love the Summer Olympics. I always anticipate it and get ready to watch my country get destroyed by another country I never knew existed. But moving on to the world of fiction and the Summer Olympics and how they can intertwine with each other, uh, they don't. Not very well at least. There really isn't much to go off of because I'm not going to accept that this series of games are real because you would have to pay me millions of dollars for me to even acknowledge the fact that these games exist because they don't and they never will. Also Mario and Sonic are really the only ones to do it and get it right in my opinion because again this series of games definitely doesn't exist. But it's not the Olympics as much as the developers want to make you think that it's the Olympics. To put it in more simple terms, those games are really bad. Also, those developers don't have the rights to use the Olympic logo in their game, but I don't think Family Party 30 Great Games Winter Fun would be any different with the Olympic license attached to it other than boosted sales by like a dollar. But I guess that's why we have first party, third party games, and shovelware. You know, the three musketeers of gaming. So after Germany's best Wii game of 2007 was released to relatively mixed reviews, mostly for understandable reason, we fast forward to 2009 where a rumor from a Spanish Nintendo magazine mentioned a sequel to Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games would be created for the 2010 Winter Olympics. Luckily for Sega, the IOC would share the royalties for the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympics, so that gave them the green light to get started on development. Speaking of which, according to IGN, development started immediately after the first game was released back in 2007. A few months before the game was finalized and set to release, the Wii Motion Plus was put out as the world's most versatile wired Dragon Ball. Honestly, that's the best similarity I could think of. Nintendo was thinking of many different ways of implementing it into this next game, but that idea was tossed into the garbage because developers weren't sure if it would be used as much as it was for Wii Sports Resort, even though in order to play Wii Sports Resort, you had to have Wii Motion Plus. But I guess it's the thought that counts. So instead of the Wii Motion Plus, we get access to the Wii Balance Board, as some of the sports support that controller. You know, Nintendo has never been good at deflecting, but it's nice to see the Balance Board back in action. 
Mario and Sonic at the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympic Games released on the Nintendo Wii alongside its DS counterpart first in North America on October 13, 2009, two days later in Europe, a day later in Australia, and November 5, 2009 in Japan. Just like last time, we're focusing on the console version. Now let's actually talk about reception this time around. In general, we got above average to relatively high review scores over the DS version and there are a lot of mixed reactions and some reviews that I agree and disagree with. So let's talk about it real quick. Game rankings listed the average score as 77.86% for the Wii version, but let's get a little freaky even though we started getting freaky when we started adding decimals to percentages. IGN stated and I quote, most of the events use a whole lot of waggle or over exaggerated controls where it could have made for a better experience, as they gave the Wii version a 6.5. But what do you expect for a Wii game? You're going to wiggle and waggle and sometimes it will be a little over exaggerated, but the motion controls were never perfect even with the Wii Motion Plus as it was made for those gestures to be more accurate. Although said motion controls even with Wii Motion Plus were more than exceptional at the time. GamePro stated and I quote, where the original had a sense of novelty and charm, this sequel feels a little dated and tired. Honestly, I believe that's a fair critique as at times it does feel a little more dated than the original, but it still looks and feels really good. Eurogamer praised the game, stating that, and I quote, it's true to say that Mario and Sonic at the Winter Olympic Games is no Mario Kart, but it's a fun, polished party game with a broad appeal and a marked improvement over the previous one, and I also agree with this to every extent because this game and all other Mario spin-offs that aren't Mario Kart will never be Mario Kart even though this game does have smaller elements of Mario Kart in its sports, but it's never fair to compare a racer to a party slash sports game in any sense. Game Revision praised the game as well, stating that Mario Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games isn't going to surprise anyone with his gameplay, graphics, controls, or concept, but it's a perfectly serviceable party game for the Wii, and once again, I agree with that. At the end of the day, it's nothing revolutionary, but putting that type of expectation on a random party game is kinda crazy to me. But it's gonna happen with every game, so it doesn't really matter what I have to say about a 15 year old game, even though I've done that more than twice and I don't plan on stopping now. So by New Year's Eve of 2009, the game had sold approximately 5.67 million copies, making it Sega's best selling game in that fiscal year starting that March. Although, as of March 2010, Sega sold 6.53 million copies in Europe and the United States. Would this be a step up from the original, or should we go into this with an open mind? Because this is a completely different setting from the Summer Olympics. Either way, we'll find out soon enough. Also, to me, Winter Olympic Games sounds better than Olympic Winter Games, so that's why I switched up the wording for my own personal game. This is Mario and Sonic at the Winter Olympic Games. So, welcome to Vancouver. It is very cold, and I promise that's not where my secret cabin is located. So, our original 16 characters make their grand return, but also make their Winter Olympics debut. We get the same archetypes back, but I believe they aren't as prevalent as the first game or even future games, but they still sort of kind of matter, even though you can get the world record with any character you want. Team Red is back alongside Team Blue, but each team adds two new characters to the mix, with one character for each type. Bowser Jr. is the new all-arounder, and Donkey Kong comes in throwing a barrel at you, because what else do you expect from Donkey Kong? On the other side, Metal Sonic is the newest speedster, while Silver has a literal advantage over every single character, but just like Sonic and Shadow, he decides to hold himself back, mainly because he doesn't want to hear the Silver gets a Silver Metal comment. He wants to go gold, so he might as well turn into Super Silver. It's really cool to see more characters get added, even though every time I played this game and future games, they stand out so much, but I think that's because I played 20 hours of the original game in the span of a week and a half, but it's great to see more faces being added. Also, I really like that the ladies get some unique winter outfits, but it also makes me wonder what kept the developers from doing this for every other character. Yoshi, Sonic, Shadow, Tails, Knuckles, Bowser, Bowser Jr., Donkey Kong, Silver, and Vector are all freezing to death because they're basically naked, and we just look over that for some reason. Also, while taking a look at everyone's facial expressions change on the first frame when you pick them on the character select screen, we see one of the most cursed things in video games that I've ever seen, and that's Shadow unironically smiling. I don't even know where to start with this. I can't take this man seriously anymore, even though I never did in the first place. This guy says damn like a hundred times every level in his own game, and this is what we're subjected to when playing this game. Thank god we never see it again. The Miis also make their grand comeback, and luckily they have a very unique element that make them worth more than we play motion. We'll get to that later on, so let's move on to our brand new winter themed sports. Similar to the original, we got different variations of one type of sport that are separated and they act as their own sport. So we got 16 Olympic events and 16 dream events 
events, rounding out a total of 32 events, only to a very specific exception, and that's because a few of these sports are separated by playing solo or with a team. We'll get there with every sport, but let's start with alpine skiing. We got downhill and giant slalom. Downhill is sliding down some really thick ice, and we have to go through these flag gates. If you completely miss them or hit the flag straight on like a maniac, you get a time penalty that will be added to your final time. Whoever has the faster time wins. Although Giant Slalom is a much faster version of Alpine. Same idea, same gameplay, just in a different setting and is much quicker to finish. Although in Giant Slalom, you want to try your best to hit the inside of each flag gate in order to get a nice speed boost. So basically, if you really want to focus on your skiing craft and want to take your time, play Alpine. But if you're playing this game against your will and just want to get it over with as quickly as possible, play Giant Slalom and you'll be one step closer to getting out of prison. Ski jumping is the first sport that brings in the team elements of this game. The general gameplay is that you want to stay as balanced as possible on your way down and once you make the big jump you have to fight against the wind and stick the landing the best you can. I'm absolutely terrified. Highest score wins. The team setting is literally multiplied by 4 as you can play either all 4 of your teammates or watch them ruin your chances at getting the world record by turning them into CPUs. Luckily you don't have to watch the CPUs but do not show any sort of confidence as they'll choke away your win when you start having hope. But this is a cool sport to live vicariously by because we know you're not going to attempt this for any amount of money. The last normal skiing event is freestyle skiing. Mogul skiing. I've talked about this before but it's a lot more complicated here than DECA Sports 2 and takes more time to understand which is beyond me because last time I checked DECA Sports 2 was supposed to be the inferior product but I might have to invest in Hudson Soft again. Ski Cross is a race down a snowboard track with skis. The controls are very interesting and most of the time it's pretty inaccurate and kind of clunky and slow. It gets to the point where you're flying at a wall. This course was clearly made for snowboarding and it never works for me but the CPUs are stupid so I managed to win from the start. Well speaking of snowboarding it's time to snowboard down an icy river. You know that analogy kind of sucked. We only have two normal snowboarding events which is interesting to me because I think snowboarding is cooler than skiing but I guess skis are more functional for more activities but I'm just overthinking things. We've also seen this one before but it's more fun this time around. Instead of just timing our first jump we actually get to perform some tricks instead of letting the game do it for us. Just swing your arm around and stop before you turn into a massive snowball. We come back to the crossing event except this time around the controls are much smoother. Like I said earlier this course was made for Sean White even though he does half putt but my point still stands and now we get to my favorite winter events and that's speed skating but I have unfortunate news. We got three speed skating events instead of five but we'll get back to that. First up is the 500 meter. We raced in this huge arena and next thing you know it's over. I love speed skating and I'm cool with it in this game and I like the controls because it makes sense. But why only 500 meters and why no relay? It makes the usual sport feel more empty because we only have one normal speed skating event while the other two are short track speed skating, both the 1000 meter and the relay. Honestly, controlling this sport gives me an aneurysm. It's because turning feels really jank and you have to tilt your Wii remote and manipulate your character in order to get a speed boost but I've never hated speed skating more than this. Next on the list is figure skating. Dancing melodically on ice is a beautiful sight to behold and I like it here as well we just have to time our swings and do a variety of actions and watching these characters figure skate will always be extremely funny to me the skeleton and bobsleigh is alongside speed skating and figure skating as events I want to witness in person I want to see humans glide down ice as fast as a bullet train and I always imagine myself as a skeleton athlete whenever I play around with one of these honestly I can't help myself they're so much fun well until you get run over or slide into a sewer we have to stay with within the path which is known as the best way to get a faster time. The longer you stay within this path, the faster you go, but you can come to a screeching halt by hitting the wall or sliding off the path like a psycho because you're scared of sliding head first down a massive hill. Even though it's not a hill, even though you are going sideways, which is kind of insane to me. I know the real athletes have to wear helmets, but if Mario and Sonic don't, then damn it, I'm not going to either. Please don't vote for me, I'll make a terrible president. Next up is one of the most frustrating sports to play, and that's ice hockey. I generally enjoy playing ice hockey in other video games, but here, it's not fun because there's no such thing as you scoring. Moving around is fine, passing is a cool concept as the more you pass to your teammates, the more powerful your shot will be and could stagger whoever the goalie is, and giving you the smallest advantage so you can try again, but the chances of that happening are as high as me finding love. Basically, trying to score is terrible. Having to shake the weird mode is so lame because it doesn't feel like I'm doing anything. Also, the pacing is messing with my brain because that's not how physics works. 
work. You also have to shake the Wii Remote in order to body check your opponent so you can get the puck back, but I'm not gonna waste my last fuck on this sport. So moving on to the final normal event, and I do enjoy this one in real life, curling. Basically a strategy game in a cold setting. Think of it as human sized shuffleboard with different rules and it's cold. Whoever has the most stones near the middle of the target wins that set, and whoever has the most points by the end of the entire game wins. I like the strategy element of curling. It's basic and simple, but very satisfying thinking you're the smartest one in the room. We all know you're not, but hey, at least you have that confidence boost, and yes, I am talking to myself because that red arrow is warranted. Now let's get into the dream events. I find it funny how the next game in the franchise quadruples the number of dream events, but I can understand the first game having a small number because it's never been done before, and also because you won't find Michael Phelps and Katie Ledecky diving from 10,000 meters. Every sport has its own dream event, and like everyone states, these are a lot more interesting than the original sports because there's a lot more character and personality to these sports. I want to say real quick, that the first five dream events I'm gonna talk about are going to have a team version of that sport, but each sport plays the exact same, so I'll go over both solo and team versions of said sport, starting with Dream Alpine. This is a race down Seaside Hill, and we get access to items to gain an advantage or slow down our opponents. And the individual version is fastest time wins, and during the team version, it's basically the same thing. You want to go for the fastest time, but you race with all of your teammates at once, and everyone's time will be added up at the end of the race, and the team with the fastest time wins. This exact same concept goes for these next few sports. Dream Ski Jump is one of my favorites as we fly through Good Egg Galaxy and the goal is to collect star bits in order to gain points and whoever has the most points wins. This one is super cool because I love the idea of flying through space on skis and going through obstacles in order to win. Something about it is really nice to me. The team variation of the sport is similar to the time based dream event but this time every team member is responsible to get as many points as they can and the total will be summed up at the end and whichever team has the most points wins. The gameplay is very smooth as we glide around and screw over our opponents with red shells. It's nothing but pure quality. Dream Ski Cross is the same idea as Dream Alpine, except this time it's more like Mario Kart because we're racing through Mario Circuit from Mario Kart Wii and we have to complete two laps as fast as we can. We have the same general gameplay as Dream Alpine and the same final results when playing as a team. Dream Snowboard Cross is really cool once you get the hang of it because it does take a little bit to get used to the controls, but when you get it down, it's very satisfying fine to play. Also the general setting being Radical Highway makes for some really cool views of the entire stage. Basically just avoid obstacles and once again, same result system as Dream Alpine and Dream Ski Cross. Best time wins. The final dream event with team options is probably my least favorite with a really cool concept, Dream Gliding. This has absolutely nothing to do with the Winter Olympics unless I'm missing something but good lord is this event very clunky and weird. Basically we have to fly around and shoot green shells at our opponents and robots to gather up points with extra items from item balloons, and whoever has the most points when time runs out wins. I never knew how to get lots of points at once because there's somewhat of a lock-on system, but we also have to remember that green shells aren't red unless you're colorblind. Amazing concept, but the controls are kinda whatever, really clunky, it's really tough to make a smooth turn, and gaining points is pretty inconsistent for me, and one of the worst parts is whenever you get hit by your opponent, you basically fall to your death and lose all your momentum since it takes a minute to get back into the action. So am I experience if you get hit you might as well just take the L. Let's actually continue talking about my not so favorite events so we can end this segment on a positive note. Dream Ice Hockey is literally ice hockey with items, thwomps, and special shots based on archetype. These elements do make the gameplay more interesting but the general hockey gameplay itself from the original is still frustrating to get around and I try to have a skill character on my team for an advantage and now that I think about it that's the only other dream event that I don't really like. In my opinion Dream Bobsleigh is probably what the special stages and Sonic Heroes should have been, because I believe here it controls a lot better and it's basically if those stages were in the Olympic setting of sorts. It's a lot of fun to avoid hazards and the more balloons you pop the faster you go. Fastest time wins. Dream curling is literally bowling and I love it. Getting to use items to gain an advantage and having to strategize your throw while you go for the perfect game. You can also use the bumpers to your advantage when future frames get more complicated, but this is a really cool idea that worked very well. This next dream event is similar to Dream Glass lighting, except this time it actually has something to do with winter sports, but honestly snowball fights should become a professional sport in real life and turn into an Olympic sport, please for the love of god. Dream snowball fight is similar to dream gliding as it stands out so much compared to everything else, although this is obviously connected to the winter sports. This is a basic snowball fight with the addition of items, whichever team has the most points wins. It's always nice to deck Donkey Kong in the face with a snowball. Next on the list is another very unique event, dream figure skating. An amazing 
amazing standout as we get to choose from Mario World or Sonic World and we put on some beautiful shells for the people. Honestly, the gameplay speaks for itself. It's really cool. For me, the absolute dream sport is dream speed skating to an extent. This is much better than the original because not only is there a lot more space to work with, but turning is a lot more manageable because it's not as strict because of the wider space. Also being able to do tricks, use items, and slide into a wall if you feel like it. These sports are great. I love the expansion of dream events. The original events are fun in their own right. There's something to love, but that also includes something to dislike because short track speed skating, dream gliding, and both hockey events I'm personally not the biggest fan of. The gray area of sports that I just look over is only moguls and ski cross. Everything else I thoroughly enjoy. I know this is the first game of the Winter Olympics and I'm aware that this sport I'm about to bring up is in the following game, but I do wish we got the biathlon, which is a 10 kilometer sprint or pursuit where you ski and shoot at targets. I think that definitely could have worked with just the Wii remote, but I guess Sega and Nintendo decided until this. I feel so bad for this game. Similar to the last game, we got a good number of other game modes to choose from, but this time around it feels like we have a lot more to do, which is nice. With the main game mode being winter games and single match, where you can play by yourself or with other people. Although, we have a very intriguing mode known as the festival. Think of this as a massive circuit from the last game, but we're actually going through the entire winter olympic games from beginning to end as if we're actually there. After the opening ceremony, the days go by as we train and compete for all the Medals, although the biggest factor of winning the entire festival is racking up points. We have the option to play solo or as a team, but nothing really changes except the difference between solo sports being replaced with team sports. Also, I think it's really cool that in the team festival, if you pick a specific group of characters, they'll be named whatever fits, or you can just name the team yourself for fun. We also get special guest appearances of specific characters. They act as our rivals, and we have to compete against them in specific events. Starting with racing against King Boo and Alpine Downhill, then Omega comes out of nowhere wanting to speed skate against us. Then we got a reminder of Sonic Riders when Jet challenges us to snowboard cross. But luckily it's not a bad reminder because this is 2009 after all. The most random of these challenges in my opinion is that we have to race the Bullet Bill and Skeleton. I have nothing else to say honestly. Rouge thinks she has what it takes to beat us in figure skating. And I find it very funny that you can put her up against Bowser and he'll destroy her with record breaking scores. King Boo tries to get his revenge on us and challenges us in Alpine Giant Slot the second time around. Hi, this is me when I'm editing. Um, I forgot to mention one more rival that you have to go up against and it's Eggman N-Word. You go up against him in Ski Cross near the end. I don't know why they chose that name. Like, I don't know what's wrong with saying Eggman Beta or giving us another Omega. I have no idea. I'm sorry, rant over. The second to last rival you go up against in the festival is Eggman N-Word. I'm sorry. And so, after 15 days of action, there is one aspect of the festival that I personally do not enjoy and that's on the the final day of events. Our final rival is Dry Bowser, and of course the final sport we have to play is my least favorite. We have to go up against Dry Bowser and his three Dry Bones minions. And the worst part of this for me is that Dry Bowser himself is the goalie, and because of his general size, it's going to be tough to score on him. Also, you can't finish the festival if you lose. You have to win in order to complete the festival, although you have to beat every rival in order to keep making progress. But for me, Dry Bowser is the most annoying because the ending is right there and the trophy is staring at my face just wanting my embrace and yes that sounds really weird although I do understand why but it's still very frustrating that I have to play hockey against my will but other than the finale I love everything about the festival and going for higher scores gives it a lot more replay value and that also applies to playing this event with the team so moving things along there's a dedicated training mode which never made its way back to any future games on consoles and I admire this a lot giving the players an option to learn the gameplay and get a grasp of the controls very nice quality Quality of life improvement. But apparently being considerate of the player's feelings isn't profitable enough because it never came back. But you know what is profitable? We Fit, more so the Wii Balance Board. A handful of these sports can be played with the Wii Balance Board, and they control exactly how you think they would. I guess this was the only substitute for the game not being able to get the Wii Motion Plus compatible, but it's fun to dabble in every now and then. Now let's move on to the miscellaneous modes. This game is technically a sports slash party game, so we got three party games to be very confused about. This feels like an experiment in a sense. Mainly if people enjoyed them enough, they would bring it back in the future. Spoiler alert, they never came back in the future. Balloon Attack, Pop 
as many balloons as possible and avoid the booze as they'll take points away from you. We have a limit to our ammo and once we run out we can put up a barricade and get in the way of the other players and whoever has the most points by the end of the final round wins. We can also use items to our advantage by popping item balloons. But we have to play a sport before every round to determine who gets the most ammo and obviously you want to win because you want the most ammo because you want the most points. Basically big numbers are really good. This is a pretty cool mode but when it comes to these types of mini games where you have to aim at balloons and just shoot them wherever it is pretty monotonous and really slow. It's not terrible but it'll never be my first choice. Next up is wheel challenge. This is where we spin a wheel to determine a leader. You have to face off against said leader in a sport and if you beat them you'll steal points from them. Although the leader will receive points for every player that they defeat. So the most points the leader can get is 30 points in one round. Each player starts with 100 points and whoever has the most points by the end wins. But there are two unique spaces that the wheel can land on. The question mark acts as an event space where you can get bonus points and then there's the team space where it activates a 2v2 team event. This is definitely my favorite out of the three because I like the unique idea of leader versus everyone and you're the only one who can determine your fate by winning each and every round no matter what. The final party game is panel flip. This is where you have to play events and earn mobility in order to turn the panels into your team color and the team with the most panels of their color wins. I believe this has the most unique ways of using items. Speed shoes increases your mobility by one. The barrier puts a shield around one panel of your choice so the other team can't pass over it and make it their own. The boost steals mobility from the other team. Lakitu places a character on whatever panel you want. The Chow can turn a whole row or column into your team's panel and the lightning reduces opponent's mobility to zero and it costs them a turn. So basically they can't do anything. The strategy is pretty important with this mode in order to get the most panels in every round. Honestly I was very surprised when I played these games and I can definitely see myself coming back to wheel challenge and panel flip pretty often. These quick and easy mini party games are a nice change of pace and they're without a doubt the most unique parts of this game alongside the new dream events. But it's pretty unfortunate that it never came back because there's potential here. Next up is the shop. A super cool idea and pretty well executed in my opinion. I love this city environment with a bunch of buildings that act as these shops. Also characters walking around interacting with each other is a really cool touch that makes this game more charming. There's a lot of stuff to buy and lots to customize which is one of the coolest aspects of this entire game. Going from left to right we can listen and purchase music from both Mario and Sonic franchises alongside a bunch of original songs from this game exclusively. The sports shop is where we can customize our skis, snowboard, bobsled, and even our glider. I love this addition as we can buy patterns, decals, and banners. And after you buy them, you can customize to your heart's content alongside creating your own color palettes. I was genuinely surprised with how deep this can go. And it's really cool to see your creations in action during specific sports. Next up is the boutique. Here is where we can buy clothes and accessories for our Mies. Not only are these nice to look at, but whatever piece of clothing you choose will switch up your stats. But you can create whatever you want with the outfits, hats, gloves, and shoes. But the fun doesn't stop there. We can buy full on costumes of Mario and Sonic characters ranging from playable characters to side characters. This is where things can get more crazy and cursed, but creativity is more than welcome here. Next up is the library, which in a sense acts similar to the gallery from 2008, except this time there are a lot more historical books to look at, even though you have to pay for them. So even when I'm relaxing in my secret cabin, video game taxes still find a way to haunt me. I do believe having to work for these historical facts by playing mini games in the first game felt a lot more rewarding in a way, but I don't mind just straight up paying for them either, because if you played the game for an hour or two, you might be able to buy every single one of them that fast. Finally is the secret shop, which can be unlocked if you buy a special pass, and this allows you to buy lottery tickets if you're feeling lucky or if you're poor. You can choose from a random decal for your equipment or random clothes for your Miis. Also, in order to buy anything, we just have to play the game and earn stars based on how we perform in the sports. And we also get a ton during the festival since we're playing a lot of sports back to back. You can also decorate the town with aesthetics to make it feel more lively since my headcanon is that these characters just live in Vancouver so they might as well feel at home. This without a doubt makes this game more charming and I really enjoyed this addition. The records mode is similar to 2008 as we can take a look at our own Olympic and world records we set. We can also take a look at our awards and accomplishments we earned while playing and if I was playing this game in 2009 I would be able to look at worldwide rankings with Wi-Fi connection but take a guess at what year it is. Nothing too special going on here but feeding your ego could not be easier with this mode. Conceptually there is a lot to the options mode but because it's been 15 years since this game came out only three of these options are really 
really worth looking at. From switching the looks of your profile, to changing the game's language, and the Wii balance board check if you still have one. If this were 2009, I wouldn't be playing this on my Wii U, and I would be able to take a look at the forecast channel for some reason. You know, it's kind of hard to call this game an evolution of 2008 when it's completely different in pretty much everything other than the Olympic setting and characters. But it is nice to see what a Winter Olympic game would look like. There are a lot more sports to play, a ton of creativity with new dream events, some really underrated extra content, and a surprising amount of replayability. I wouldn't say this is how every game is going to be from now on, although there are similarities to the next game, but it's obvious that it doesn't copy said next game either. The Winter Olympic games tend to be overshadowed by the Summer Olympics in my opinion. The same thing goes for the Winter Olympic video games. Not only are there two on consoles, but the Summer Olympic games just seem to get more attention. But that doesn't take away from the quality of the Winter Olympics, both real life and in video games. I really enjoyed this game as I haven't played it for years and being able to fully experience everything on my own made for a lot of fun. Even with the additions of a lot more extra content, new characters, and a lot more sports to play, I believe the first game is a tad bit better, but Vancouver 2010 is right behind it. Either way, I love how this game gives more representation to the Winter Olympics, and I believe it was executed very well. Two games in on consoles, and the franchise is making strides to becoming greater with every entry, so let's hope 2012 can keep it up. Also, someone remind me to avoid future eviction notices on my cabin, because the pile just keeps getting bigger, and I don't know what to do.